Hi there, welcome to week four of Contemporary Art. This mini lecture today is on an important movement that happens, kind of starts to emerge in the late 50s and then is prominent in the 1960s. It is a movement called minimalism and there are practitioners of this form of art on both coasts. So you have a California minimalist group and you have a New York minimalist group. And you can get into like long philosophical discussions about whether or not these are diametrically opposed or whether they have different philosophies. I'm not going to worry about that so much because really I think in hindsight you can look back and see that the minimalist artists all had a fairly similar approach to making art, whether they were painters or sculptors or what have you. And uh, they have some things in common regardless of whatever. I mean, one of the prominent minimalists will look at a guy named Donald Judd used to hate that label minimalism. He He would always say he wasn't a minimalist. But you know, as art historians, we can kind of look back into the past and say, oh, yes, Donald, you were a minimalist. So uh, we're not going to get into philosophical debates. We're just going to look at this movement that comes after abstract expressionism is sometimes thought to be a kind of reaction against abstract expressionism, where you've got so much of this kind of mystical stuff going on. Guys like Rothko, Newman, and Pollock all talked about sort of either subconscious or spiritual meanings for their art and always insisted that their paintings were, although abstract, about something, about experience, about metaphysics, uh, about the soul, things like that. The minimalists are going to going to reject that idea and reject the kind of hoity-toity uh, approach to art that the abstract expressionists might take. One of the prominent minimalists famous quote is, with minimalism, what you see is what you see. In other words, art made by minimalist artists is meant to be complete in and of itself. It's not meant to evoke some sort of spiritual reaction. It's not meant to celebrate the artist as a great craftsman. Uh, it's not meant to glorify anything in particular. It's just what it is. Now, you can argue with that too, but we'll just take that for, for what you, uh, you know, for what it is. One of the prominent art critics of the 20th century, a guy who's still around, who's very, actually kind of conservative, a guy named Hilton Kramer, he's a New York Times art critic, actually said, the more minimal the art, the more maximum the explanation. That was his complaint about minimalism, is that there's so little there that you need a whole philosophy to kind of underpin and justify its existence. And I'll let you sort of judge for yourself how you feel about minimalism after you look at some of this stuff. What minimalism has in common or what minimalist artists have in common are a couple of things. First of all, they tend to work in repetitions of forms. In other words, they make serial editions of things. Uh, not serial as in cornflakes, but serial as in repeated numbers of objects. So seriality is an important part of minimalism. Minimalism is also what you call in art history lingo reductionist. In other words, they boil things down to the very es essential forms. So if you're a sculptor, or the essential formal components that make up an object. So if you're a sculptor, you're going to boil things down to the simplest shapes possible. If you are a painter, you're going to boil things down to the simplest colors possible. Uh, it's reductionist. It's taking everything, sort of stripping away all the extra components that you're trained to add as an artist and making an object that is as simple and complete uh, into itself as it can be. And the minimalists also tend to emphasize the idea that it's the formal qualities of art that are important. It is the building blocks of art that they want to foreground. They really emphasize that it's a physical object and that they want it to be simple, very basic, not expressionistic, okay? In fact, one of the painters that uh, we'll look at used to say, I wish my paintings could be made by a machine because he wanted them to be so completely removed from any kind of external associations. It's really a kind of extreme version of the idea of art for art's sake. Well, the first artist I want to look at is actually a guy who, if you took uh, European art of the 20th century, you might be familiar with, a guy named Joseph Albers, who had fled during World War II, had fled from Germany, and had been an important uh, leader at the Bauhaus in Germany, the design school in Germany, modernist design school, flees the Nazis and ends up in the United States. He will actually teach at 
Black Mountain College, which is the place where uh, Robert Rauschenberg was going to school, okay? He teaches at Black Mountain College and gets to know Robert Rauschenberg there. So interesting connections going on. Later on, Albers will go to Yale where he trains a whole generation of painters in color theory. And in fact, if you're in graphic design, you may have even had to purchase a copy of his book, The Interaction of Colors. It's a classic in the field of design. So here's Albers first, and he's our first example of a kind of minimalist artist. He did an entire series of silk screens and lithographs on basically the subject of the interaction of colors and he called this whole series the homage to the square and then he would give each different um, it, each different individual image its own name but they were all part of this whole series homage to the square and what he said about the reason that he did this is that the square was the most plain basic boring shape that you could find in nature uh, or the basic shape you could find in geometry, that it had no dynamism, that it was a, a, essentially an empty vehicle into which then he could uh, do all this other stuff. And what his main thing was, the, his interest was in how different colors react to one another, how colors change when they're placed next to one another, and things like that. So the Homage to the Square series is really a series about color. It's really not a series about anything else. It's not a series about some greater, you know, expression of Joseph Albers' soul. It's not a meant to be a mystical experience. It's meant to be art about itself. It's meant to be as simple, plain, and non-referential as humanly possible. So I'm just going to show you a few of these images here so you can see where he's taken the same basic idea squares of color laid on one another and uses it over and over over a period of years to to really just make images that again are not about anything not I mean he doesn't want you to stand in front of these and cry the way Mark Rothko did he wants you to get something about color about the image itself so here's another homage to the square this is a silkscreen version some of these they're not very big by the way they're sort of a um, I forget the exact measurements, but they're not really more than about two feet long and uh, 16, 18 inches wide. So, I mean, the, the pages they're printed on. So they're not enormous. They're just uh, small lithographs about color. And here, again, there's the same basic repetition of shapes, but then with a different series of colors, so you get a very different look. And you can see, even on the monitor, how the contrast that he uses sometimes make these colors kind of vibrate against one another and that was something he was very interested in is how complementary or contrasting colors affect one another and change the look of a particular color. Here's another homage to the square from the series this one called Votive and again the for him it wasn't even really about you know it wasn't important to have different names or anything this is where you've got three different reds uh, played off against one another which you can barely see on the screen here. Uh, but at any rate, this is a 20-year series that he does, just the uh, subject of color itself. He said in an interview when somebody asked him, why did you do this whole series on the square? He says, well, the square is the least natural shape. It's the one that you're least likely to think of something else when you look at it. And he said, art should not represent, but present. And that's very typical of minimalism. Art should not be about something else. It should be about itself. Here's just another one, and I'm sorry I forget the title of this particular one, but I think you can get the series, the interaction of colors, the whole just sort of the, the subject being how colors work with and against one another. Art simply about the process of and the building blocks of making art. So it's very reduced down to the basic, color, basic elements of making a picture, color, shape, line. Uh, reductionist in that way. So good example of the sort of typical project of a minimalist. Here another famous minimalist painter that uh, we're going to look at is Ellsworth Kelly who's still working by the way. Um, he's getting up there but he's still around and still doing this kind of stuff. This is his blue, green, yellow, orange, red from 1966. Per makes perfect sense, right? Because that's what you see in front of you. Blue, green, yellow, orange, and red. 
and it is actually painting oil on canvas it's actually hand done you can't see too well here that it's a painting rather than just you know a series of um, a series of uh, whatever blocks of color made on on a computer and that's really what Kelly was after it looks here like in my PowerPoint screen the red section has gotten cut off a little bit so don't be fooled by that each of these each of these little rectangles of color is the same exact size canvas and he's colored them obviously with a single color unmixed with other colors um, the basic colors really part of the rainbow right just a very simple plain um, reduced down to one of the basic formal components of painting color and this is very typical for Ellsworth Kelly later on he will make essentially single colored shapes that he sticks on the wall but might have a little bit of a, a convex, a convex nature to them so they curve out from the wall a little bit and he, he likes those to be thought of as sort of self-contained sculptures but here you've got some of the basics of minimalism reduced down to the very very essential formal elements of painting color in this case each element of this painting overall is the same size so you've got a kind of repetition going on and a kind of serial image going on here uh, and then also stripping away reference to the artist like I said Kelly wanted people to think that his objects were made by machines and not by human hands here's Kelly's red green and blue from 1963 some of the same uh, observations can apply here. In this case, you know, you've got a painting that's really reduced down to color and shape and line. And really what this painting seems to be about is the reaction of the different colors against one another, especially when you see that red and green together and how where they come together, there seems to be a little bit of a point of vibration. Um, but very simple, unadorned, flat surfaces of color meant to be as unreferential and simple as possible and as you can see he's continued working on this this is an Ellsworth Kelly series from a little later on I want to say this is from the 1980s but at any rate you can see as a minimalist he has continued in the same vein each of the paintings is the same size each of the paintings is one color only they are spaced evenly from one another hung at the same height on the wall they are very very basic building blocks of of what you do in two-dimensional art and it's not meant to reference anything else it's not meant to give you a spiritual experience it's not meant to be look at what a great painter Ellsworth Kelly is it's meant to be a simple self-contained piece of art I mentioned that he had started doing these sort of paintings that were sculptural. Here is Yellow with Red Triangle from 1973, where you've got a similar kind of thing going on. I mean, instead of a serial repetition of a shape, here you've got two basic shapes and then color, which you might consider components of sculpture hanging on the wall. But again, reduced to the very bare bones of an object. Now, uh, moving on to sculpture, the last, or actually the second to the last artist that we're going to look at in minimalism is this guy, Donald Judd. This is probably his most famous <clears throat> series of series that he created. This is Untitled. This particular one is from 1965. Untitled because, and again, you know, Judd really believed in the whole idea of the object speaking for itself. In this case, there are several of these untitled in different locations around the world, and they're all the same basic setup. You have a series of boxes. All the boxes are the same size. They are mounted on the wall at an equal distance from one another. They're all identical within, the seri within that group in this untitled. They're all made of identical materials. In this case, it's um, polished brass for the outside perimeter, and then the two faces of each box are... Uh, in this case, lucite, red lucite. In other cases, <coughs> the boxes are made entirely of like polished steel or they might be made of anodized aluminum that has a blue color. Within the series of untitled, each different untitled, all the little units are made the same. Um, in the whole group of untitled that are out there in the world, they're all the same measurements, they're all the same installation distance from one another. So you've got a series within a series here. 
and his idea was that what you would see when you looked at this, and it's really true, I've seen, there's one of these in, on permanent display in Bloomington um, at the IU Art Museum. One thing that is kind of interesting about these is each box, even though it's exactly identical, and you can see this a little bit here in this image, even though they're exactly identical to one another, the light coming in the gallery, the time of day, the relative position of each of these in relation to the source of light, whether or not somebody's standing somewhere that casts a shadow on the piece, the shadows that each individual object casts on one another makes all of these things, even though they're quite the same, look a little bit different. Now, you can think that's exciting or not exciting, but my point here is that this is one of the things that minimalist artists are trying to do, is to make such a simple object to see how variations in the environment will affect the object. This is something we also saw with Robert Rauschenberg's white paintings, where he basically had flat white paintings on the wall of a gallery, and then people would come in and stand in front of them, and depending on the ambient light and shadows being cast, it would change the nature of the painting. Same thing is going on here with works by Donald Judd. He doesn't want to be narrating, telling you a story. It's not meant to represent anything. He felt that it was not important to represent the world, but just to present the object itself. So here's another example from the Untitled series made from a different set of materials, so you can see that it has a different effect. And I think you can see here just from the reflections on the um, surface of this particular version of Untitled that you've got you know, interesting variations within essentially a very, you know, plain, unassuming object. Donald Judd once said, and I don't know, this might have been facetious, that he wanted all of his work to be boring. When he got a kind of critical question from a, an art writer, he said, that's the point. I want this stuff to be boring. Now, you can take that with a grain of salt if you want, but anyway, um, this is probably his iconic series from the whole minimalist um, project. And here's another version of Untitled, you can see. Here again, this is, like I was saying, this is a different material. These are boxes made out of anodized aluminum with that kind of cobalt blue. And there you can see, if you look at the shadows cast in between the different objects and whatnot, you can see how, although they're all exactly the same, depending on your vantage point, they all look different. The, the color, even though it's a uniform color over every surface, even looks different. And there's a nice close-up of a different anodized aluminum untitled just to give you a sense of how light and shadow and the interplay of colors really affect the look of the sculpture. And again, it's those basic building blocks of sculpture and art, the basic formal units that are the subject of something like this minimalist work. Oh, and here's another Donald Judd, since you were probably getting sick of looking at the untitled, the other untitled. This is another Donald Judd untitled piece from 1970. And this is based upon a mathematical formula called the Fibonacci progression. So this is where, as I've got written on the slide here, each number is the sum of the previous two numbers. So the length of those little purple units along the length of that simple plane white aluminum band up on, uh, above the purple units so that each, the length is equal to the sum of the two previous uh, lengths. Okay, so it's expressing a mathematical idea in a visual form. It's only meant to be about this self-contained set of relationships and um, then the physical presence of the object. And again, you can love this stuff or hate it. I don't have any dog in that fight, whether or not you like it. I just want you to understand what it is that the minimalists are trying to do and kind of think about how this is a really different way of approaching art than the abstract expressionists or the art informel group or even uh, people like the new realists and the um, arte povera people in, in Italy, right? This is a very different attitude towards art that emerges with the minimalists. And what's interesting is, as time goes on in the contemporary period, some aspects of minimalism will kind of stick, some aspects of the nouveau realiste will stick, and um, the abex will stick, you know, just different stuff. So you'll see all kinds of interesting things mixing up these different philosophies as we go on in the course.
Oh, another Donald Judd, untitled. Here you've got cubes instead of the rectangular boxes. Highly polished stainless steel. And there again, I think you can see how this is an interesting set of visual relationships that are generated by these very plain, very unadorned boxes. And uh, that they're meant to have no external reference. But again, here I think you can also recognize some of the, the vocabulary words I mentioned at the beginning of this lecture like seriality, reductionist, formalist. The concern of Donald Judd here is how these boxes are going to look together, how they're going to reflect light or reflect the wood grain of the floor of the gallery or reflect the reflections of their neighboring boxes. And then finally, for uh, sculptors of the traditional media, this is the last image we'll look at that we're going to look at somebody who gets classified as a minimalist and you can argue about that but we'll we'll see him in a second tony smith's die from 1962 which is essentially a black box that has been put on a little pedestal so that it looks like it's actually floating or levitating about an inch and a half or two inches off the ground a self-contained cube is it a reference to anything else it's oh by the way it's six feet um the measurements of each face, six feet high, six feet wide, six feet deep. Okay, so it's an, a completely cube form measuring six by six by six. Some people have debated whether or not this is minimalist uh, because, you know, a black box with the title die does seem to have some references. Is it a reference to the idea of uh, one of a pair of dice? Is it the black uh, reference to the idea of death? Is it a reference to the idea of consciousness? There's some um, psychological theory that talks about the brain being like a black box. Is it a reference to the idea of burial, six feet underground in a box? Uh, you know, so you can kind of play with that a little bit if you want. I think you can see how in some ways, though, it's very tied to minimalism. It's very plain, basic, unadorned shape. It is what it is. As Frank Stella said, what you see is what you see. Okay, now we're going to switch gears a little bit. This guy, Dan Flavin, <clears throat> is classified by a lot of critics as a minimalist. Donald Judd also, um, who was a friend of his, by the way, Donald Judd also classified as a minimalist and objected to it. But again, there are some reasons why you might call this guy a minimalist. Flavin's interesting because he is going to introduce a new medium into sculptural vocabulary in the 1960s. That is the use of fluorescent tubes of light to make sculpture. And they will be light sculptures, essentially. He only used prefabricated, commercially available, available at the retail level, fluorescent light tubes. So he didn't fabricate his own fluorescent lights. He bought them, and he bought them only in standard units of measure and standard colors that were available. And he would sometimes, as in this case, pink out of a corner to Jasper Johns from 1963. It's a pink fluorescent bulb that has been mounted in the corner of a gallery and emits a kind of light. Now here again, the reason that he's classified as a minimalist is because this is a sculpture that's really essentially just about color and light, two building blocks of art, okay? What is it, how does it, you know, and it's a standard measured tube. You put it in the corner. How does it visually affect the, the space around it? I think you can see in the slide how even though it's placed in the corner of a gallery, that pink light kind of diffusing out of there, um, erases the corner so that you can't really see above the light that it's actually placed in a corner. You can see the gradations of pink kind of changing as they emanate out of that light bulb. You can, again, love Flavin or hate him is fine with me. I want you to understand why he's called a minimalist and what it is he's trying to do. Because, again, one of the things that will happen is, and Flavin's a good example of this, as are like the Arte Povera people, more and more stuff will be considered fair game as media for making art. So here you've got standard issue commercially available light bulbs that are becoming part of the art vocabulary. 
Flavin once said, my work is what it is, and it ain't anything else. Uh, he liked to title his works with like references to other artists in um, the contemporary world and in history, but they are um, also in some ways not meant to be really referential. Although, interestingly, his earliest paint or his earliest light sculptures, he mounted fluorescent light bulbs, gold fluorescent light bulbs on wall hung boxes, calling them icons in reference to um, Byzantine icons, you know, and the idea of them emitting a spiritual light. So you can kind of, I don't know, play with whether or not Flavin's really a minimalist or whether he's got some spiritual connotations here. Here's another example of an installation in a gallery of a Flavin sculpture, alternating pink and gold from 1967. And you can just kind of see there on the walls, long um, fluorescent tubes at regularly spaced intervals on the gallery wall. And then the whole idea is that you would go in here and you would experience this interaction of different kinds of light, creating a sort of ambient feeling in the gallery, okay? It's meant to be about the experience of looking at light. And here's a quote from Flavin. Um, it is what it is, and it ain't nothing else. Everything is clearly, openly, plainly delivered. There is no overwhelming spirituality you are supposed to come into contact with. I like my use of light to be openly situational, in the sense that there is no invitation to meditate or to contemplate. It's, in a sense, a get-in and get-out situation and it's very easy to understand. One might not think of light as a matter of fact, but I do. And it is, as I said, as plain and open and direct as an, an art as you will ever find. Okay, so that's straight out of the horse's mouth. That's why he gets classified as a minimalist. My art is just about what it is. It's not meant to be anything else. It's just here is light and the interaction of light. This is another view of alternating pink and gold. So, you know, these things are hard to capture photographically. You really have to go see something like this in a gallery to get a full appreciation of what it actually looks like. As any of you who do photos know, light is a tricky thing to capture on film. And so, um, you know, I can only kind of give you the barest representation of what these things look like installed. But I think you can see how he fits into the minimalist paradigm with the kinds of quotes I was just reading to you. Here's another example. Oh, Sonia was his first wife. Red and green alternatives to Sonia from 1964. Commercially available, same lengths. Here you can see the minimalist reduction in seriality and formalism going on. Um, you may know this, that in light, the primary colors are not, uh, what is it? Not yellow, blue, and red, but red, green, and blue. Okay, so green replaces red as a, or replaces yellow as a primary color when you're talking about light. And so here he's working with two of the primary colors, working against one another. Colored light behaves differently than pigments on a canvas. So this is really a lot of what his work is about, is experimenting with how different colors of light interact with one another and how they um, affect one another and what sorts of optical experiences they create. And that should sound familiar thinking back to our two-dimensional artists like Joseph Albers, for example. Here's a series that he did. Um, and this is a photo from a retrospective, so you can see another work in the very back there. The, green tubes uh, horizontal and then the red tubes upright in the very back of the picture. But the other thing I wanted to show you is he does like, <clears throat> Dan Flavin does like, as does Donald Judd, as you'll know from reading that um, excerpt from Donald Judd that I have posted on Blackboard, he really liked the Russian constructivists of the early 20th century who were trying to create a new art, a new an art that broke with the past and broke with tradition, an art that would be modern and of the here and now. And so here's Flavin's um, series of homages to Vladimir Tatlin, uh, his mo and Tatlin's monument to the Third International. That's pictured there. This Tatlin's tower from the <clears throat> early era of communist Russia 
was a utopian vision that never got fulfilled, never got completed. So that's just a mock-up of this tower that he had projected to be created that was going to be all new and modern and dynamic. And then that's Flavin's series of homages to Vladimir Tatlin and his unrealized tower. So monument, various numbers, um, monuments to Vladimir Tatlin. And uh, using all commercially available prefabricated um, light bulbs that are then installed in these various patterns. So not as completely a-referential as, say, Ellsworth Kelly, but again, what Flavin insisted on was a kind of minimalist philosophy. And then finally, one last Flavin sculpture. This is another homage from 1970. Here, homage to Barnett Newman. And here, interesting thing that you can see going on, even in this photograph, is the way that different colors interact with one another, and then the way that, in a way, Flavin seems to be invoking Barnett Newman's zips. Remember, although Barnett Newman's zips always run vertically across the canvas, here you've got these two yellow zips running horizontally across essentially that kind of bluish, purplish background created by the lights that are radiating back toward the corner of the room. So again, Flavin's idea is a very, you know, specific interest in light and its properties and the color interactions of light. And that is really what his art boils down to and what it represents. Flavin died, I don't know, 12 years ago. There is a, a, a museum in his old studio that's run by the DIA organization that we'll run into again, the DIA Foundation, which is very heavily invested in um, minimalist artists of the 20th century. And, you know, last time I taught this in class, uh, a couple of people asked a really interesting question, and I'm just going to throw it out there because it's kind of a fun philosophical question that I don't really have an answer to, but I think is an interesting thing to think about with an artist like Dan Flavin and with this whole contemporary art emphasis on idea as opposed to craft, and that's something that's very, very heavily part of the minimalist movement. What happens when Flavin's fluorescent bulbs burn out? He died 12 years ago, so surely some of the fluorescent tubes uh, from the 1960s that he created his original sculptures with have, you know, since stopped working. So what happens when somebody else takes out a burnt out fluorescent bulb and puts in a new one? What happens if they just find notes of, of, of Flavins that say, I'm thinking about installing you know, three pink tubes this long, horizontally, uh, 16 inches apart from one another on a gallery wall. What if he never did that? And then somebody, some curator comes along and reads that and then puts that installation up. Is that still a Dan Flavin work of art? I don't have the answer to that, but I think it's an interesting thing to keep in mind because this question of authorship and authenticity and you know, the importance of the stamp or the hand of the artist is a constant question that is always being kind of knocked about when you're talking about contemporary art. Certainly the Arte Povera guys question the idea, uh, as does, you know, Yves Klein the, and the Nouveau Realiste, and we'll continue to see that as an issue or a question, uh, even when we look at pop art, the whole question of who is the creative genius and things like that. So just something to keep in mind and a, a good question that students asked me last semester that I, I think it's good to sort of ponder as time goes on. So that's it for my lecture for today on minimalism and the next lectures will be on pop art of the 1960s and I'll see you then.